welcome all to the third session of the day i'm happy to introduce professor venkatesh raman uh, for uh, his invited lecture professor venkatesh raman is from institute of mathematical sciences chennai is a professor there and his uh, interest research interests are in parameterized complexity and exact computation exact algorithms and also he works in data structures sorting algorithms approximation algorithms and so on and today he is uh, talking about uh, exact exponential algorithms should also add that he is one of the finest speakers you will see so enjoy his talk over to you okay so first uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this school um our workshop or whatever this is the last day last afternoon so it's not a very heavy it's going to be a light lecture so my um, topic um, as pradeesh mentioned is uh, exact exponential time algorithm so exact meaning is clear as opposed to approximate algorithms right you you have several lectures on um, approximate algorithms but here we would be worrying about exact algorithm and <coughs> the problems we'll be looking at are uh, you know np complete or worse so under the popular conjecture you don't expect an algorithm which is polynomial in the input side <coughs> but if not polynomial you know uh, can we paint them all in one brush and say exponential or are there uh, different classes of problems in the exponential world and that's what uh, i want to just illustrate through a bunch of examples and a couple of algorithmic techniques which you are already familiar with we will see a variety of uh, problems with different complexities in the exponential world itself okay so so this had uh, i mean origin long ago in 60s people looked at um, good exponential algorithms for traveling salesman problem which i will uh, tell you but you know in between uh, a lot of research got sidetracked to approximation algorithms in as a, as a method to deal with and complete problems parameterized complexity is uh, another recent approach but now this is getting a revival this you know exact exponential algorithm there is a recent book which is about 4 or 5 years old um by uh, this nice cute book by Feder Fomin and Dieter Krash it's talking exactly about various tools and techniques in the exact exponential algorithm world so let's start with uh, so the vertex cover problem you have seen in probably in approximation in parameterized algorithms where your input is a graph and what i am interested in a minimum vertex cover vertex cover as you recall is a subset of vertices such that for every edge at least one of the end points is in the subset okay so i am interested in minimum not k sized vertex cover as you would have looked at in the parameterized algorithms and i am looking at exact algorithms and not approximate right so what would be a and, and you know this is an np complete problem so you don't expect a polynomial time algorithm what is a sort of a brute force algorithm to find a minimum vertex cover and how much time would it take Mm -hmm. try all subsets of vertices check whether that covers all edges and what would be the running time 2 power n right so there is a two power n times some polynomial term to check uh, 
whether this subset is the vertex cover or not. Can you do you know any other better algorithm? Okay. Yeah, those are greedy algorithms, and by now you should have seen in the approximation algorithms scores are somewhere else that they don't necessarily produce the optimum. K equal to one. Aha, uh -huh, I see. So okay. So what she is saying is that um, try all subsets of size one, subsets of size two, go on. So it may not be all the way up to the end. The first time where you get some subset that covers, you stop and you got the optimum. But in the worst case, it can be as bad as two power n. Can you know? Do you know any other better? Okay, let's let me change the question. Suppose I want to know whether there is a vertex cover of size k. How fast an algorithm do you know? Right now, this is a parameterized algorithm. You've seen it in parameterized algorithms course. I want to know whether there is a vertex cover of size at most k. Do you remember the algorithms you have seen? What what time they take? Exponential in k, but what? 2 to the power k is a very simple algorithm where you just branch, right? Okay, the 2 power k algorithm works like I pick an edge and I observe that at least one endpoint must be in the vertex cover, in any vertex cover. So I pick that vertex, remove the edges incident on that, the remaining graph recursively check whether there is a vertex cover of size k minus 1. If I find it, great. If not, I pick the other vertex and recurse. And how much time will that take? That's like a 2 power k. But have you seen something better? So, <clears throat> so there are better parameterized Algorithm. So, in particular, I'll, I'll tell you one, but uh, there exists something like, I'm going to put this notation, 1.28 power k algorithm to check whether G has a vertex cover of size at most k. Over you know series of developments in parameterized algorithms, now we know that it's one point. No, that the point is that there are, there is an algorithm which can tell you in 1.28 power k time whether there is a vertex cover of size at most k. Okay. I won't be able to tell you how that algorithm works because it runs into several pages, but there are some very simple algorithms which you can see which beats two power k. Um, for example, you know that pick any, suppose I pick a vertex, if I don't include it in the vertex cover, what can you say? All the neighbors must be in the vertex cover. We can take advantage of that and do a better branching algorithm. So how does it, how do I do? So I, for example, um, so uh, let me just describe something like a branching algorithm. I pick a vertex X. Um, so this is G, whether I'm interested in a vertex cover of size K, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to include X into my solution and look for a vertex cover of size K minus one in this recursive call. On the other side, X is some vertex. I'm not going to pick X. So you all told me that I'm forced to pick all the neighbors of x so i will say g minus n of x right so in this branch so i'm doing a recursive algorithm in one branch i pick x some arbitrary vertex x into my solution delete it and check recursively whether there is a vertex cover of size k minus one in the other branch i pick all its neighbors and recursively check for a vertex cover of size k minus size of n of x, which is the degree of x, right? 
Now, what kind of uh, running time would this algorithm result in? So, if I break it up and write a recurrence relation, <coughs> what will be the recurrence relation? If I ignore everything else and keep only k, then my t of k, suppose that's the running time, it's actually a two-parameter recurrence because I have to include the problem size, but let's ignore that for the moment, is less than or equal to t of k minus 1 in the other one side, and in the other side, k minus degree of x, so in the worst case, which in the worst case could be 1. So it could be k minus 1, and if I have t 2 times t of k minus 1, how, what does it solve to? 2 power k. You know, that's not what I wanted to get to, right? So let's assume that your vertex has degree at least 2, okay? I will come back to what if not, right? So if I, if my vertex is degree at least 2, then this recurrence will be something like this. What is the solution to this? Does it look familiar? One point? Right, so this is Fibonacci recurrence, and so this will solve to 1.618 per k. Right? So every time if I pick a vertex whose degree is at least 2 and branch like this, either I pick that vertex or pick all its neighbors, I will get this. Now I reach a stage, suppose there is no vertex with degree greater than or equal to 2. What does that mean? Isolated vertices and edges maybe. That, you know, that part of the vertex cover I can trivially solve in polynomial time and complete it. Right? In fact, you can even assume there is a vertex of degree at least 3. Because if every vertex is degree at most 2, the graph will be paths and cycles in which you can solve polynomial time. So it's even better. So in fact, I can put 3 here and you get a better base here. Okay? So this is the game in this branching algorithm of parameterized algorithms. And <coughs> so quickly, in, in uh, 5 minutes, I explained to you an algorithm which is better than 2 power k, which can do something like 1.618 power k, to answer the question, is there a vertex cover of size at most k, right? Now, if I want to use this to solve the, my original question, find the minimum vertex cover, how can I do that? Hmm? Go binary search, yeah, okay. How much time will that take overall? What is K? Yeah, okay. Good, so I'll just say for minimum vertex cover, we have something like 1.618 per and some polynomial term. Okay? Big improvement from 2 power n, which we started off with. Okay? And if I use my best known parameterized algorithm, I said there is one of complexity 1.28 power k. And try for every value of k, I can improve this base to even much smaller than what I have written down here. Okay? So this is the game in the exponential world where can I improve 2 power n? I thought I will see examples where even 2 power n is hard to get. Okay, maybe you have to start something even bigger. So at least for minimum vertex cover problem, you've seen that you can actually get an algorithm whose complexity is something like c power n, where c is much less than 2. Okay. So now if you want to do the same thing for a related feedback vertex cover, A feedback vertex set. I don't know whether they saw a feedback vertex set. You know what a feedback vertex set in a graph is? Yeah. What is it? <coughs> Acyclic. Right. So the the set of vertices that cover all 
cycles. Right? Vertex cover covers all edges. Feedback vertex set covers all cycles. <coughs> you want to find a minimum feedback vertex set. Again, there is a simple 2 power n algorithm. Try all possible subsets. The best known parameterized algorithm for this has something like 3 point something power k. Okay, So that's not very useful to get us to beat 2 power k because you try that for every value of k, you're, you're not going to improve 2 power n. So it, it was actually a struggle to, you know, some, the initial paper on feedback vertex set, improving 2 power n was like a 10 page paper, which gave something like 1.99 something something power n now. Okay. So the thing which we quickly got for vertex cover, we, you know, it's not that easy for other problems. <coughs> so in particular, a related problem feedback vertex set, you know, first algorithm with c power n, c less than 2 was quite complicated. Not only quite complicated, the improvement was not very much. <coughs> but later on, um, there is a paper in uh, stock 2016, I think, Symposium on Theory of Computing Conference, where which related parameterized algorithms and exponential algorithms in a slightly different way. It's not, you don't just apply parameterized algorithm for every possible values of k. Sometimes you use that, sometimes you do something else. And if you do a combination of it, then, you know, I'll, I'll just leave it here. Using which you can get, you know, slightly better than 2 power n algorithm for feedback vertex set without going through all this 10 page case analysis. But the point I want to mention is that the game is really hard, okay. Um, so <clears throat> even in the exponential world, there are 2 power n algorithms. Sometimes beating 2 power n may not be that easy. And that's a good challenge. There are a lot of open problems around that area. Okay, let's look at another uh, example, let's say 3 sat. Okay, this is a canonical NP-complete problem where you have variables and you have clauses. And each CI is like a three variable thing, which will be like the R of three variables, something like this, right? And the question is, is the formula, so it's uh, R, is there an assignment to the variable such that every clause is simultaneously satisfied? Okay. So again, what's a brute force algorithm? Try every possible assignment. How many are there? 2 power n. So that's uh, now I want to improve this 2 power n, right? <laughs> Again, quickly you can see that if, if you have clauses like this, if one such clause is x2 or x5 bar or x7 bar, you don't want to try an assignment which sets x2 to 0, x5 to 1 and x7 to 0, right? You know that I will, so let's say I pick, when I went to one clause, look at the three variables and look at that assignment that will falsify that clause. That is an assignment I don't want to try, right? Suppose I do that for one particular clause, how many assignments will I save? Let's, let's, let's say I'm doing it for one class for now. I'm just taking one class, let's say this class, and I'm saying, okay, you try all possible assignments, 
except those that says x2 to 0, x5 to 1, and x7 to 0. So how many assignments are there? Half. To power n? To power n minus something. What is that? To power n minus 3. Okay, how many? Yeah. How many overall, right, between x1 to xn? How many of the assignments to x1 to xn will make this clause false? 2 power n minus 3. So, those are the assignments I don't need to try. So, I'll try the remaining, right? So, this is like. Not an asymptotic improvement, but some. And uh, you can play this game again and again. But if I want a, an asymptotic improvement using this idea, what can I do? <coughs> if you recall um, Strassen's matrix multiplication algorithm, what he managed to observe was that two two by two matrices normally will take eight multiplications. He managed to do it with seven multiplications. And how did that help in getting a uh, improved algorithm for multiplying two n by n matrices? Hmm? Yeah, I'm just looking for one word. Recurse, right? Yeah, exactly, right. So recursively really applies. So can can we do this somehow? Use this idea and try and do some recursion, right? So what am I going to do? I'll go to my first clause. There are eight possible assignments to the variables in that clause, out of which one I'm going to reject. So there are seven possible assignments. So try all seven possible assignments. <coughs> Each assignment will get rid of those three variables from the formula. Right? I set x1 to something, x2 to something, x3 to something, simplify my entire formula. Okay? And check now the remaining formula is satisfiable recursively. If it doesn't, I'm going to try the other assignment and so on and so forth. So seven possible, so it's like a branching algorithm again. What would be the running time? Uh, what would be the depth of the branching tree? So for each of the seven assignments of the three variables in the first class. algorithm, a tree with seven way branching, what would be the height of this tree? Hmm? Yes, so what would be the height of the tree? Every branch we are removing three variables. Next branch will remove three variables and so on and so forth. Hmm? N by three. Right, so overall running time would be branching factor of 7 to the height of n by 3, 7 power n by 3, right. Asymptotically better than 2 power n, right? Because 2 is 8 power 1 by 3. So 7 power 1 by 3 is some 1 point something something power n. 
right? So we have an algorithm. I mean, there are some little details which are omitted, like what if you know some clauses get shortened? Maybe it will become it will have only two variables. Those things are actually work better for you. But modulo those details. You have an algorithm with running time c power n, where c is strictly less than two. Now, if I, if I want to do something like this for a general set, where there is no bound on the number of variables in each class, <coughs> we don't know how to do it. Okay? So, When I say general SAT, there is no bound on the number of variables in each clause. We don't even know whether there is a 1.999 power n algorithm. In fact, it is believed that that's not possible. This is a conjecture, and it goes by the name strong exponential time hypothesis. Roughly translated it to that for general chat, we don't expect an algorithm which is better than 2 minus epsilon for power n <coughs> for any epsilon. Right, so this is like this is like a conjecture like anti-complete problems don't have polynomial time algorithms. Now we do use that conjecture to do some reductions and deduce more things. Here also we can do. So now you can use this hypothesis as a base, design, you know, design some reductions, and you may be able to argue that, oh, this problem, for example, currently exciting work is going on in trying to show that polynomial time algorithms, like shortest path, finding a diameter or something, whatever algorithms you have, n square, n cubed, is optimum unless this fails, which means that if you can do that better, you can solve SAT better than 2 minus epsilon. So there are lots of such work that's happening around, based on this conjecture. Okay, So, so this, this gives you a feel that for something like 3 SAT, we quickly came up with an algorithm which is better than 2 power n, similarly for vertex cover. <coughs> But for feedback vertex set, it is possible, but it's hard. For general SAT, we don't even know whether it's possible. So already there are a variety of problems in the exponential time world itself. OK, let's move on to um, different kind of problems. Let's talk about TSP. <coughs> one problem, you are given a complete graph, so there is an edge between every pair of vertices with distances on them. Now you want to find the cycle that visits every vertex exactly once, come back to the starting vertex. Among all such cycles, the one which has the total distance, that distance of a cycle is some of the distances on the edges. <coughs> so this is a, again a classical NP complete problem. 
the decision version of the problem is what would be a brute force algorithm to solve this? Hmm? How many are there? N factor, right? Is there the one C is basically take all possible permutations of your input. You might say I go from one to three to five to seven to two to blah 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 and count the cost. Different permutation, count the cost, and collect the minimum. So that's an n factorial algorithm, right? <sighs> it's much worse than two power n. Right? This is another dimension kind of a thing, right? Something like vertex cover, two power n was easy and we can quickly get to something. But here <clears throat> The brute force algorithm takes n factorial time, right? It turns out long ago, 62, there was a paper which gave an algorithm using dynamic programming that takes 2 power n times some polynomial in it. We will actually go through that. <coughs> so this is due to Held and Cartel. Okay, so then we're going to use <coughs> So if I want to design dynamic pro programming based algorithm, we need to identify what are the sub problems I need to compute and then somehow build my solution towards it, right? <coughs> Before that, we want to identify some nice optimum substructure in the input that will lead us to the sub problems we need to compute and that will lead us to the recursion and everything will follow, right? So if I look at the optimum cycle, let's say it starts at one. One is some vertex and goes to somewhere <coughs> and then comes back to one. So one is some arbitrary vertex in my vertex set. So from one, it has a choice of going to any of the other vertices. But what we know is that this path is the shortest path that starts from here, visits every vertex and ends at one. Okay. <coughs> so let me define my sub problem as P I S. As the <coughs> length of the shortest path that starts at I <coughs> and ends at one. One is some canonical vertex. So this is sort of the sub-problem I want to compute, <coughs> which is that I start at I, somehow visit some subset S exactly once and come back to 1. These are the sub-problems I'm computing. So what is my goal? Somehow, Hamiltonian cycle problem is like a permutation problem. If you're trying all possible permutation, that's what leading me to n factorial. I want to translate that into some sort of a subset problem. <coughs> because the number of subsets is 2 power n. Okay, so this is what they did. <coughs> then what is my shortest Hamiltonian cycle? I claim it is, what is my goal? I want to compute um, I can say I not in here. 
doesn't matter. Some convention I use. And S is some subset of V. <coughs> Then semantically, what is this? I want to start at 1, visit every vertex of V minus 1 and end at 1. And among all of such paths, I want to find the shortest path. This is exactly what I want. This is my goal. Okay, so dynamic programming, the hard part is coming up with what are the sub-problems I need to compute. Okay, I have magically thrown this at you. After that, it will be clear. Right? What is the base case? What is the goal? Where do I want to go? And how do I incrementally compute it? Right? So, what is incrementally that's going to happen is the set S, which will be gradually, you know, I will do smaller and larger and larger sets. Eventually, it will get to be. <coughs> so, the base would be P of 1 comma some singleton i x i is not equal to 1 <laughs> what would this be the length of the shortest path <coughs> actually not 1 comma i i can say <coughs> i comma j I want to do this for every vertex and every subset, right? So, for every vertex, I pick a set which is single 10 as a starting point. Then I want to find the length of the shortest path that starts from i, this is j, and goes back to 1. <coughs> so, it will be i, j, j1, that sum of the two distances. Actually, I can even make this to be the empty set to start with then it'd be simply i1, right? And as I build on, can we say what? <coughs> at the induction step, if I have p i some s would be <coughs> I start from i, Go to some vertex J. No. I start from I, go to some vertex J, and then <coughs> visit everything except in your S minus J and go back to 1. Yeah, so here, you mean this P, I, comma, S. Hmm. You mean a path uh, in the subgraph induced by I and S together? Because otherwise, hmm. uh, ah, I see the path from I to J. can go outside of S. But if, uh, yeah, it can go to, you're right, absolutely right. Yeah, in the induced Indeed. graph on GI union. I and yes, good point, yeah. <laughs> okay, so how do I get, so I want to start from I, visit everything in S and go back to 1. One way to do it is go from i to j, and then start from j, visit everything in s minus j, and go back to 1. What is j? Yeah, okay. So, which vertex? Hmm? Try over all possible j and pick the minimum, right? So, that's why I left some gap here. <coughs> So from I, I want to visit everything in S and go back to 1. So try 1 by 1 some vertices and then finish S minus J. And this this is a sub-problem which is already done, computed, I have stored it. So I just have to plug it in. Okay. So standard dynamic programming, recursion, base case, 
goal if you know what's the problem to compute, right? <coughs> this is it. So you start with some empty set for S, and then gradually build, and eventually get to V minus one, and that's the. Two power n into n is the number of sub problems you are computing. <coughs> and to compute each one, you are having a minimum over some n possible entries because this is already computed, you just have to plug it in. So that's like an n square. <coughs> so improving from n factorial. Okay? And this is not been improved for the last 50 years, so it remains 2 power n n square here. <coughs> so in a set cover problem, you have a universe, let's say that's 1 to n, and then I have a family of sets, and each fi <coughs> contained in u and the goal is to find the smallest subfamily that will cover the universe So my universe may be one, two. <laughs> Something like this. So you have a universe and a collection of subsets of the universe and I want to pick some small number of them from this family whose union is exactly the universe <coughs> but this number of subsets I pick is as small as possible. Okay, So this actually generalizes a lot of problems, vertex cover, dominating set, various problems which is and it's um, NP hard, NP complete. <coughs> And um, again, what would be a brute force algorithm? <laughs> All subsets of F. Ah, right. All possible subsets of F. <coughs> See whether the union is set and pick the one the smallest. So how much time? Two power M. Right. M could be very, very large compared to N, right? Because it's a family of subsets, M could be as bad as 2 power N. <coughs> Turns out there is a very simple dynamic <coughs> programming again algorithm which improves it to something like 2 power N. Let's see how it works. Let me make sure I press the correct button. This one, right? Ah. So you have a universe. <coughs> Yeah, how do you design a DP algorithm for this? But 
So let's look at this set, last set in the family. Either it is in my solution or it is not. If it is in the solution, in the optimum solution, then what is the re remaining problem? Remove the elements of FM and find the optimum way to cover the remaining elements of the universe using, using 1 to m minus 1. If it is not in the solution, <coughs> just drop FM and solve the problem. This suggests you know, how to get your dynamic programming started. So I'm going to say, <coughs> let's say opt. So the important thing is what are the sub-problems? The sub-problem, there are two dimensions. One is, <coughs> in one case, in both the cases, I am trying to cover something with 1 to m minus 1. If I put fm into the solution, I am trying to cover some subset of u, the remaining subset of u, using 1 to m minus 1. If you don't put fm, then I want to cover the entire universe using f1 to fm minus 1. So, <coughs> when the right says this, opt. Minimum number of sets from f1 to fi to cover x where x is <coughs> right. using f1 to fi I want to cover my subset x how many minimum what is the minimum number of sets I need that is my sub problem I am trying to compute right I will sub compute this for every x and every i <coughs> So what would be the base case? I equal to 1, right? If I am allowed to use only F1 to cover X, how many sets do I need? <coughs> what is it? So, yep. I'm allowed to use only F1 to cover X. So if F1 contains X, then it is one set, right? So one, and otherwise, I can't cover at all because X, F1 doesn't even contain X and you're allowing me, so what, what should I use? It's a minimum number I want to say. So what's the natural thing to put? infinity right? <coughs> so this is a starting point what is my final aim my final aim this is of the base my goal is and <coughs> at the inductive step <coughs> That's what we already argued, right? So, opt x i equal to <coughs> i is bigger than 1. Either I take the i-th set, so it's a minimum of opt of x using first i minus 1 alone. I don't take the i set into my solution or or I take fi into my solution, delete that from the universe and then try to cover the x minus fi from 1 to i minus 1. <coughs> yeah, it's there. I just want to see you. Is that all? plus one, right? So, in, because in this case, I'm picking one set. That's it. 
the entire FTP, right? Because finally, incrementally starting with <coughs> one, I can go all the way up to M for every set. Because to compute I, all I needed was X I minus one and some subset of X I minus one. How much time does it take overall? How many sub problems do I compute? For every X and for every I. So that's like two power N. <coughs> into M sub problems and each computation is just minimum of two entries which are sitting in my table. So it's a constant time. <coughs> this is my overall time. Right? Again improving from 2 power M. <coughs> Okay, so I have a flavor of exponential algorithm. N factorial, which we managed to improve to 2 power N. 2 power N, which we managed to improve in some cases, which we could not. Here it was 2 power some larger parameter than the universe size, which can be brought down to 2 power N. So let me do my last example, which is the graph coloring problem. Okay. This is the best possible, yes. There is also a conjecture which says that you can't improve it. Yeah. No. <coughs> it's an independent conjecture. It's called set cover conjecture. Yeah. All right. Let's look at graph coloring. So this is not a subset problem like vertex cover, it's not a permutation problem like uh, Hamiltonian cycle, <coughs> it's some sort of a partitioning problem, right? So what is the graph coloring problem? You want to color the vertices, minimum number of colors such that adjacent vertices don't get different colors. <laughs> What is the question I'm going to ask? What's the brute force algorithm, right? Yeah. Um, but I mean, we need a benchmark to see where we are improving, right? Um, <coughs> okay. So let's ask a simpler question. If I want to know, can you color the graph with K colors? What would be the proof for how many combinations? What is the running time? Hmm? K, power K power n, right? <coughs> Can you color with K colors? You just try go to each vertex, you have K possibilities, and then see whether adjacent vertices get the same color. <coughs> What about for k equal to 2? Hmm? Okay. It is polynomial time because you're just checking whether the graph is bipartite, simple linear time algorithm can do it. But for 3 colorability onwards, the problem is anti complete. Okay, so we want to improve this. <coughs> So, you know, in particular, if the minimum number of colors required is very large, like root n or something like that, you're talking about root n power n. Okay, not even a constant power n, but it can be as bad. <coughs> but you can use set cover to solve this. Let's see, can you formulate this as a set cover problem? So one way to think about it is that what is it you want to part you want to do in coloring? You want to partition <coughs> the vertex set into minimum number of minimum number of what? Independent sets. You want to partition your vertex set into minimum number of independent sets. Okay. So suppose I I do the following, right? My universe 
<coughs> the vertex set. My family is all independent sets. Then um, does you know the put the set cover problem turn into the coloring problem? So I claim that you know the minimum number of independent sets together that will cover my universe. That's the coloring number. <coughs> so one problem is that this this sets may not be uh, disjoint because in your covering your covering covering and partitioning are different but it's okay <coughs> if you have a collection of sets together that cover the universe but they are not disjoint you can still give that many colors right but anything you know do in some systematic fashion give the first set one color and all vertices of the second set which are not in the first set as a second color and so on and so forth and that so you can give some connect you know one to one connection between the set covers the minimum set covers and minimum partition of the vertex set into independent sets so now if i use my set cover algorithm how much time will this take assume that i can enumerate all independent sets in the number of independent sets time <coughs> which in the worst case can be how big can f be in the worst case could be all possible subsets to power n so so the algorithm set cover algorithm running time was 2 power the universe size times the number of sets so if my number of sets can be as bad as 2 power n so this overall will be like a four power n. <coughs> Still better than k power n because this k is not even fixed. Whereas this four power n for any k, I can find the minimum chromatic number in four power n. <coughs> yeah. So I'm so I'm just saying. The graph coloring problem is essentially a set cover problem here. Why? Because minimum number of sets from this family, which together will cover my universe, is exactly the coloring number. So you just run my set cover on this. How do I get all independent sets? Okay, there are algorithms which can enumerate. Given a graph, it will run through and enumerate all independent sets. So you just get that. There is some systematic way of enumerating all independent sets in you know in two power n time. Even better than that, but that's good enough for us. <coughs> so using Well, it turns out you can actually construct a more direct DP for graph coloring as follows. <coughs> so we make this observation that no, we don't. We don't even need to make this observation now. We'll do it later. <coughs> Yeah, we can do a direct <coughs> DP instead of going through set cover DP as follows. Basically, I, I find some independent set in my graph, color that set with color 1, so optimally color the remaining graph. Okay, so total number of colors is 1 plus whatever colors I use. Run it over all possible independent sets and take the minimum. 
Okay, so one can prove that. <coughs> so this is a symbol, right? The chromatic number of G is equal to minimum of one plus. If you have not seen it, is the coloring number or chromatic number. Because you know each color class is independent, so I just pick some independent set, give it color one, and find the optimum coloring of the remaining. <coughs> so this is a sort of a recursive substructure. So I don't want to be recursively computing this. So this naturally suggests let's do dynamic programming. What are the sub problems? Sub graphs of the graph. I find an optimum way to color that. That is my sub problem, right? In general, some subset X, some induced sub graph on some subset x is equal to <coughs> so I basically look at small subgraphs of my graph, compute the optimum chromatic number of that subgraph and incrementally compute this eventually and reach here. Okay. Now this is equal to this, I mean it requires a proof but it's not very hard. Basically this is the optimum substructure. <coughs> so this, this is the entire DP algorithm, right? Start with a word, uh, graph on one vertex find the optimum way to color it and gradually go build towards larger and larger subsets and induce subgraph on that subset. And for a large induced subgraph, I can compute this by this recurrence relation, which is one plus, you remove that independent set from here and find the chromatic number of the, mini, the remaining thing, which is sitting in your table. You don't have to compute it. Okay, just plug it in and you will eventually get it. How much runtime? <coughs> First, let's see how many sub problems are we computing. Yes? Yeah. Number of subsets. Because every subset causes an induced subgraph, so that's like 2 power n. <coughs> and for each subset, I'm running over all possible subsets of that vertex and plugging something from the table. So that could be another 2 power n. Not quite. You can do slightly. I mean, the same algorithm you can. You see, everything cannot be 2 power n, right? Initially, when you are looking at small subsets, the number of independent sets is 2 power i. If i is the number of vertices in that set. As you go up, it's going to get 2 power n. So what, what is the total number? So it sounds like 4 power n, but I'm saying the same. <coughs> so overall, it looks like 4 power n, but here is a way to analyze, right? <coughs> Number of sets of size i, how many are there? n choose i. <coughs> For them, the running time is 2 power i, not 2 power n. You can do this over all i. What is this? 
three per right? Because it's just a binomial. Okay. <coughs> so, to summarize, chromatic number, you want to know whether there is, you know, can you color with k colors? Brute force is k power n. You can convert it into like a set cover and use our efficient DP for set cover and get a 4 power n algorithm. But you can construct a direct DP for this, <coughs> which gives you 3 power n. But turns out you can actually do even slightly better by making the following observation. At least one color class is a maximal independence. In the optimum coloring. This is also easy, right? Because if it is not, you can do some adjustments to make it maximal. <coughs> so what? How, why is this useful? Observation 2. Number of maximal independent sets <coughs> in any graph is not 2 power n. Because if you think about what would be a graph where every subset is a maximal independent set? It must be an edgeless graph, but then it has only one maximal independent set. So the number of maximal independence is not 2 power n. It is upper bounded by So let's say I, I have a graph which is a perfect match. How many maximal independent sets are there in the graph? Okay, so there are n by 2 edges. Now, <coughs> what would be a maximal independent set here? Hmm? How many are there? 2 raised to? N by two. 2 raised to n by 2, right? Because you can pick exactly one from here, exactly one from here, exactly one from here. Clearly, you can't pick 2 because it won't be independent. But you have to pick exactly one from each because otherwise it won't be maximal. <coughs> so that number is 2 power n by 2. Suppose each one is a triangle. n by 3 triangles. How many maximal independent sets are there? <coughs> 3 power n by 3. Right? Turns out that is the maximum we can get. In any graph, because, I mean, you can make it like a 4 click and then see that the number will actually go down. In any graph, the number of maximal independent sets is at most 3 power n by 3. So this is an independent result. It requires some proof. There is, you know, you can recursively, there is an algorithm which will actually find it. And so this requires a proof. I gave you some examples. That doesn't constitute a proof. But you can prove that in any graph, number of maximal independent sets is at most this much. But so what? Now, if you go back to our previous algorithm, <coughs> instead of running over all possible independent sets, I already argued that at least one color class must be a maximal independent set. So let's run over <coughs> maximal independent set. Okay. Then, how does that help? Then this number is not 2 power i, but it is 3 power i by 3. So now if I do this binomial thing, it will be 1 plus 
3 power 1 by 3. <coughs> now this turns out to be something like 2.33 something. Whatever, it's strictly much less than 3. Okay. So, <coughs> we started off with the k power n algorithm, got to 4 power n algorithm, got to 3 power n algorithm. Now I am telling you that you can actually run through only maximal independent set and you can improve that to whatever this number is plus 1, which is 2.3 something something. <coughs> okay, so it's impressive that you can actually find a chromatic number in this. This is not the best. You can actually improve to 2 power n. That requires a different machinery of, you know, something which you have probably seen in your discrete math course. The principle of inclusion and exclusion is a technique which shows up several times in exact exponential algorithm, using which actually you can improve it to. Okay, so I'll just say. <coughs> <coughs> Two power n times some poly n. So the chromatic number actually can be found. The, some of these results are recent, last ten years or so. <coughs> okay, I think I will stop here. Hopefully, I gave you a yeah. Hmm. Excellent. I'm glad somebody is going to ask this. Okay, so his question is, <coughs> these, all these NP-hard problems are polynomially related somehow. And how is it that, one, you can actually do much better than 2 power n, and one I am claiming not possible? Anybody has an answer? Is the question clear? So. So, for example, I, I said <coughs> yes. So I sort of said this, <coughs> right? So now your thing is oh, but for three sat, we managed to give you give a better than two power n algorithm. So why not use a reduction from sat to get to three sat? Use the three sats algorithm and lift it back here. Why does it not give you better than two power n algorithm? I would let it there for 20 minutes before I go. I'll answer that. But at this point, I want you to think about it. I won't give the answer. But it's a nice question. I'm glad somebody asked this here. Yeah. Uh, one way to Resolve it is just actually work out the reduction. Just do take the reduction, use this algorithm and lift it back and see what happens. Right? <coughs> Look at this book. Um, so, for example, for the coloring, I gave you, or at least I told that there is a 2 power n algorithm using inclusion and exclusion. So, another thing to look at is how much space these algorithms use. Some of them use exponential space, some of them use polynomial space. So, <coughs> the 2 power n algorithm for coloring using polynomial space is open, for example. But um, offhand, I don't know. Hmm. Well, it depends what you need for compute. You may not need the entire previous sub problem sometimes. You may just need. <coughs> it, dep it depends on the problem. I'm saying, yeah, in, in the coloring, I think you need all of them. You don't know. You may need all of them, so it. Let's take expansion speed. 